Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our lectionary podcasts. We now come to Proper 10, Matthew chapter 13, and the familiar parable of the sower. And we begin on that day. Jesus came out of his home and he, he sat again by the, the sea. And the, the great crowds or the many crowds there were, were gathered, so like a congregation, the crowds, with the result that uh, he went embarked upon a boat in order to sit. And then all the crowd came to the shore and stood by the shore. Now, um, this sitting posture is the, is the posture of the cathedral, of the bishop. We recall that this is what our Lord did in the Sermon on the Mount when he gave his inaugural address, I suppose, in the Gospel of Matthew, where he explained or spoke about what the kingdom of the heavens was like. That is to say, what is the life of Christ like into which we are invited? What does the Christian life look like because it looks like the life of Christ? And then in chapter 10, we had our second discourse, uh, which is often called the missionary discourse, where our Lord sends the 12 out in order to do the miracles and to proclaim the kingdom of the heavens. And he tells them that they will be as successful in some places that is received to the homes or churches of some, and they will be uh, rejected by others. And he tells them how that's all going to work out. Now in this third discourse, he really talks about life within the congregation itself, in which um, as a preacher, uh, you will preach this message. This time it will be talked about in terms of scattering seed. And as you scatter this seed, what will happen? What sorts of things should you expect? In the missionary discourse, the message could be, both, could be either, I suppose, received or rejected. Uh, we know, though, in the congregation that uh, think there are kind of different ways in which people receive this, this message. So it's not simply an either-or, but uh, sometimes it's rejected. Other times it's received, but then um, only grows for a short while. And this is the sort of thing that we should expect, and we are warned against. Uh, this text is very important for pastors especially because it can become, I suppose, disappointing or the devil can uh, tempt us to either to be despairing and say, why bother? Because it only seems to be working for a short time. Uh, but it's also very important for people to hear because um, as they grow up in the faith, they need to know that the devil is active and that the temptations are there. And the Christian life started well does not always end well. So this is what happens and can happen in the Christian life. So the crowds are there, and he addresses the crowds. And again, he, he spoke or he preached. That's the laleo. He preached to them many things. And this is what, you know, teaching and preaching, it takes, uh, it takes a good, be, good of t bit of time. And now this is also in parables. So uh, all of chapter 13, this is Matthew brings all these parables together. And this is the, the first one. And it begins, Behold, uh, a sower went out to sow. So this is the scattering of seeds. Let the seeds uh, go where they might. We might think of like broadcasting over the radio. Uh, many people have become Christians in that way by hearing a word. And um, this is not uh, the kind of thing where it's not like fishing with a hook here. Uh, I suppose it's like fishing with a net. Um, but let the words fall upon the ears as they will in this instance. So a sower goes out and to sow, and of course as he sows in that sowing, um, some fell upon the, the road, and um, what happened to that was of course that the birds came out and devoured them, I guess because uh, the road is well trod, the seed falls on that the hard road or the path, and then the birds come and they devoured the seed. Um, still, uh, verse 5, others then fell upon the um, rocky ground. So, the Petro, we see that from Peter, the, uh, the, the rocky ground, uh, you know, where there was not much 
earth. Uh, there was not cane pollen. There was not much earth, not much soil. And um, w well, what happens when there's not much soil immediately? It sprang up, uh, but it, it is. It, but it didn't last because there was no bathos, gase. There was no depth of of earth. So um, so it. So when the sun rose, so when the sun came out, the helio, the helio rose, and it was scorched on account of the fact that it did not have deep roots. Um, and so they, it having no roots, in fact, it withered away. And this is, uh, well, we know where the having no roots is, is going to lead. Now others fell among the, the thorns and um, that grew up and, it fell, and the thorns grew up. So here the thorns arise and uh, here choked them. So you can see that uh, it grows up in the midst of things. The seed grows up as a plant but in the midst of the thorns it has no place to uh, it has no place to thrive and to live so it doesn't make it now other seed fell upon the earth the good earth and it gave forth carpon it gave forth fruit and uh, I love this there's a hecton a hundred and sixty and 30 fold. Well, that's the parable, and to that our Lord says, He who has ears, let him hear. Now, what does this parable mean? Uh, we have to go forward in our text to verse 18. Um, and it's worth knowing that in between this, our Lord explains why he tells parables in the first place. And I think it's really kind of a puzzle that he wants us to solve, like those uh, Sudoku puzzles or maybe crossword puzzles, that uh, parables give us a chance to think about things a little bit more deeply. Um, it, once they conceal from those who aren't bothering to look, but parables like puzzles are also inviting because he invites us in to think about these things the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens, which is the life of Christ, which is the life of the church, which is the great mystery, which is hidden in this world, which the world does not understand. Well, this is life in the church told simply from the story of a, a man who goes out to, to sow seeds. Well, the, the parable is explained uh, when we get to verse 18. Uh, but you, therefore... Hear this parable of the sower. Now, everyone who hears the word, well, that sounds almost Lutheran, huh? The word of the kingdom and does not understand. Um, understanding and wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, but here we have a person who simply doesn't understand and the evil one comes. Um, this is... We learned in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil or the evil one. Well, I think that's the way Matthew intends it. The evil one, Satan, comes and he snatches away that which has been sown. Now here we have in the heart. So the word did get to the ear and did make it to the heart. And yet um, it happens so quickly because uh, nothing really then happens. This is the seed, which is the word of God, which is sown. And I'm so glad that our Lord does this because it's very frustrating, I think, for a Christian because sometimes we hear the word of God and we're excited and we're wondering, why is it that this word seems to be falling on deaf ears? Is it something in the way I spoke? Uh, maybe my sermon wasn't really aimed at the heart of the person. Maybe I could have done better. And well, we should always work on improving our preaching, and yet, and yet, we have to acknowledge that uh, for whatever reason, the gospel is not received by some, and they don't seem to even care. And we shouldn't let that discourage us, though, because 
This also happened in the ministry of the apostles. It also happened in the ministry of Jesus where he gave great sermons and people uh, simply ignored him. So sometimes the seed will fall on the road and there's nothing we can do about that. Now, concerning that which is on the Petro Ode, the, that which is sown on the, the rocky ground, this is the one who, akuoin, he hears the word and immediately, ah, with great karas, with joy, receives it. Now we know this type too. I mean, it's, uh, it's remarkable, isn't it, how uh, uh, maybe a visitor comes to the church and he hears a sermon. He just loves it and he says, oh, pastor, pastor, what great news, what great news. Oh, thank you. I'm coming here, and then maybe comes the next week, and maybe even the next, and uh, then you don't see them again. And um, you go out and visit them, and you say, what happened? And they, they seem lost, and you're kind of wondering, how could this person be so excited to hear this great gospel news and to fall away so quickly? Well, it can happen in a number of ways, um, but it is worth noting that the person does receive this gospel with joy, but, but, having, he does not have a root in himself. Um, and now, what does it mean not to have a root? And I suppose this, in many ways, I think, is, it's reflective of American Christianity, I think, in so many ways. Um, because he is there, proskairos, he's there for a time. Um, but when tribulation, which uh, difficult times, when persecution comes on account of the world, he's immediately scandalized. And I certainly think we're going to be seeing a lot of that in the coming days because um, for quite a long time, Christianity has been the default religion of our nation. Um, and people have gone to church, and it's been advantageous for them in a number of ways. Um, sometimes people have gone to church because they're good business relationships. Uh, it can enhance a person's reputation. Oh, he's a good church grower, goer. But those days are fast fading away. And now the question is, are you willing to be associated with a Christ whose teaching now is becoming increasingly unpopular? And even if you received it in joy, received it in joy, are you willing to actually enter into the tribulation, the difficult times? the losing of job, the loss of job or reputation, um, and about persecution, are you willing to be defamed and mocked and ridiculed? Um, I just saw this with Margaret Court. She's a uh, great tennis player. She played for Aust in Australia, and um, she came out in defense of natural marriage, God-given marriage, as defined in uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and now this great beloved figure of Australia is being made fun of and mocked and ridiculed. And, uh, well, are we willing to, you know, receive that kind of um, bad publicity, uh, be made fun of for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ? Well, many people won't because they don't have root. Now, the root can come, I think, um, it can come in difficult times. We're forced to grow, grow roots, I think, during personal tribulation. When things get bad in our own life, they can force roots to grow deeper. I think um, good catechesis, good teaching actually grows roots. Uh, I think, think about how many of you are so uh, appreciative of the confirmation training that you had because you memorized uh, passages in Sunday school. You memorized catechism. That's growing roots. Uh, singing hymns, great hymns of the church, and actually through repetition, putting them to memory, having the liturgy as part of you is all about growing roots deep within the soil so that you're not so easily blown around by every wind. You're not a reed shaken by the wind because you have the kind of roots that can withstand a, a storm. Uh, you're not simply there because God says, you know, well, uh, he's got a good life, uh, like Job. The devil says, well, Job would lose his faith if you took away all these good things from him. Well, American prosperity has been wonderful. Um, what happens if these things are taken away from us? Uh, will we then continue to trust and rely upon our Lord? For that, we need roots, and our Lord helps us grow roots through difficult times, and also, I think, through Christian uh, practice, through study, 
through singing of good hymns and strong liturgy, our roots grow so that we're able to withstand the persecution. And um, when you think about a great tree, a tree might look great on top. It might grow so high and people will be impressed. But what really matters is whether those, that same tree has the kind of roots underneath that will keep it stable in the storm, that can withstand things. And that's what our Lord speaks about there. Now, uh, so the next one, um, example, and again, it's not simply this person or that. I think in some ways, all of us, uh, maybe we're not that first one because we've been in the church for a while that we see with, we just didn't understand it. But um, we're prone, I suppose, to any of these kind of temptations or, or pitfalls. But then there's the one sown among the, um, among the thorns. And this is the one who, again, hears the word of God. Um, but it's the, the worries or concerns of this earth are the problem. And, and, and not only the worries of this earth, but then on the other side, the deceit of wealth. And I think these are two sides of the same coin. In one sense, you could imagine the wor concerns of this earth, how many people... Uh, don't come to church because uh, they're worried about paying the bills and they just get so overwhelmed. They're, they're working all week and they, they just need a break. And um, so church kind of falls off the radar because, well, they've got the family to consider. They've got work to consider. They've got the house to consider. They've got so many of the things that they have to do that they come to Sunday morning and they say, it just if I had time, I would come to church. I just don't have the time. And then the cares, the concerns. Um, you know, that, that's why going to church, oftentimes you wonder, when, when, before you go to church, should I go? And afterwards, your head is cleared and you see things, you see things as they are and you say, of course I'm glad I went to church. Um, the church, uh, the word of God has a way of clearing our mind out and putting our priorities back into place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the rest will fall into place. But yet the cares and concerns of this world, and it could be family, it could be jobs, it could be any kind of financial situation. It could be illness. It could be anything. The cares of this concern and the deceit of wealth. Well, um, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Wealth, money, is always a promise that it will bring you happiness. Um, if, I, if I only had a little more, if I only had a little more, then my life indeed would be happy. We know this is not true. Uh, we see it in the news all the time of people who have been very successful, uh, very wealthy, and yet their lives spin out of control. And wealth is, 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 a, is a deceiver. It's a liar because wealth cannot bring, it's deceitful. It cannot bring ultimate joy much less, it cannot bring, I should say, earthly happiness, much less or ultimate joy. So what it, what it does then is it just, it chokes, it chokes uh, the word. And, and a person then becomes unfruitful, becomes like a dead branch that can only be cut off. Now these are the things that can happen again to all of us when the world gets, now, these, this is not like false doctrine. This is simply the stuff of the world getting in and invading our minds so that our priorities uh, are thrown out of place and we become uh, disordered by the things of this, this world. So all of these things. Now, this is also so very important for pastors, for all of us, because we can become discouraged. So we look at people, we say, well, the word's not working here. And other people fall away when the difficult times comes. And others just get, uh, they're led away. So is, should I keep doing what I'm doing? And the answer, of course, is yes. The word of the Lord will not return to him empty because there is the seed that is sown upon the good ground. Now, when you're preaching, you don't know what the good ground is. But let's say this, sometimes it does work. It actually does work. The seed, it's the word, is powerful. And this is what the person who hears the word again 
and who understands it. Unlike that first person, he gets it. And he bears fruit. And I, 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 I love this. Um, and he, and he, he does it, and he, sometimes it's 100, sometimes 60, sometimes 30. Now, I've seen in translations where they go, the natural thing is to have a crescendo. 30, 60, even 100 times bear fruit. Well, it's a little bit more modest. The word can work. I've seen churches that are just growing gangbusters. Uh, it's happening in Tanzania. It's happening in crazy places throughout the world where you didn't expect it. It's bearing 100 fruit fold. Other places, well, 60. Other places, 30. But know that the word does work because the word is powerful. So keep preaching in season and in out. And uh, take the seed that we have and scatter it about. And then let, let the Lord do his work. That's the message of the parable of the sower. Thank you.